All right, kids, you ready for the next installment of my top ten games from 2013? Well, I don't care if you're ready. Here they are anyway. This is going to be nine through seven, starting with number nine, Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons. Now, this and all the other indie games on this list, yes, there will be more. Uh, I did, I, I played on the PC. All my indie games this year were PC games. And unfortunately, like I said, no screen capture software, so there's going to be no footage. That being said, I only got this on the PC because it was on sale on Steam. And that being said, do everything within your power to play it with a controller, like get, a, get one of those USB Xbox controllers or something like that, because I think that's very important with this game. Because of one thing, and that's the hook for this game, in my opinion, the control scheme. Let me explain it to you. One player co-op. That's going to be the buzz term for this game. You play as two brothers... Older brother, younger brother. The older brother is controlled. He moves using the left analog stick, and he performs actions using the left trigger. The younger brother is controlled using the right analog stick, and performs his functions with the right trigger. And it's sort of this split. You have to split your mind, because the game will ask you to control both characters at once sometime. And, you know, I'm not sure how that would translate to keyboard controls, but there, I, I think there's something special and unique about having basically equal and opposite mirrored movements across your hands uh, to control these two characters. And these two characters interact with the world in different ways. Like, for example, the older brother is, is stronger, and so he can pull these, these bigger levels, levers and interact with the world in, in unique ways that the younger brother can't. The younger brother, on the other hand, is smaller, so he can fit into smaller spaces. And they work together and separate for, separated from each other uh, to basically get through this world. It's sort of a platformer, basically a platformer game with a few action elements. I, I think it's actually reminiscent of Eco for anyone who's played that game, which is a, it's a heck of a compliment because I hold that game in rather high regard. The puzzles seem very similar to me, sort of part of the environment, a lot of a lot of platforming puzzles and stuff like that um, that feel very naturally part of the environment. And the environments themselves remind me of Eco in insofar as that they're very they're, they're varied all different kinds of environments that almost feel like they couldn't exist as part of the same world, but it totally makes sense that they do. Also, the characters speak in this nonsense language, just gibberish, that's also reminiscent of Eco, although there's no subtitles in this one. I think there are subtitles in Eco. Uh, although there's no combat, at least not in the traditional sense. In this game, you're not uh, fighting shadow monsters with a stick, and it would be like if you can control both Eco and Yorda, which makes for some really, really interesting platforming and gameplay mechanics that I haven't seen in any other game, just because of the fact that you're controlling both of these characters simultaneously in real time. The game has a simple story. It's really, really simple. These, these, uh, these brothers, their dad is sick, and so they have to go out and find this medicine that's really far away, basically, and they have to go on this long journey into the unknown. And that's basically the story, but it's powerfully and subtly told. Again, no dialogue. It doesn't need to be any dialogue. You get the emotions. They come across loud and clear without the necessity of dialogue. Uh, something, something to do with uh, the fact that you're controlling both of these characters. The platforming is really, really tense. And not just because you're, a lot of times, teetering on the edge of this giant cliff. That's obviously tense. But it's also something to do with the fact that you feel a responsibility with these two characters. That if you let, would let one of them die, the other one would be severely disappointed in you. <laughs> and so you feel very, very connected to these characters. The game also features some gorgeous stylized visuals uh, that just fit really, really well with the feel of the game. It also has an excellent conclusion uh, featuring one section where the younger brother, without spoiling anything, discovers a hidden strength. That's all I'm going to say but it made for one of my favorite moments gaming of the year. At the end of the day, though, it all comes down to that control scheme, more than anything else. And it's more, it more than just bonds you to the, bonds the player to the characters. The player himself, him or herself, actually becomes the bond. You are their commonality, these two, these two characters, because you are the one moving both of them. And it endears you to these little gibberish, cartoony characters like in a very unique way that I haven't seen done in gaming before. Sadly, and this is one of the reasons why it's a little, quite a bit lower on the list than 
it maybe could have been. There are some, there are some bugs, graphical errors. There was one glitch that was fairly s- severe that made me had to go back and replay an entire chapter all over again. And obviously that's not indicative of everyone experiences of everyone's experience, but it did it did mar the overall game for me. This, by the way, was the game that knocked Pokemon X off the list, if you're curious. curious. But anyway, Brothers, Tale of Two Sons. Play it. Check it out. That control scheme. I think that's the hook. That's what's going to get people to play it, and that's the reason you should play it. There you go. All right. Coming in at number eight, Super Mario 3D World. Let me just say that this year put Nintendo back on top of their game. I thought this was a great year for Nintendo. I mean, better than last year when they were practically a no-show. Uh, you say what say what you will about their e three performance, <laughs> it, it wasn't great, but I think that they really delivered with the games. Let me just say that this game bring uh, proves that it comes down to one thing pla- with platformers. It's all about the level design, and Nintendo is shouting loud and proud once again that they are the kings of level design, that they were the originals, and that. There's just something about a really well-done Mario game that can't be duplicated by anyone. Every single level in this game does something to distinguish itself from the crowd. Either it's a new mechanic or a new visual. I feel like every single level is unique and memorable, which is something that's incredibly hard to pull off, especially with a game with this many levels. I think with this game they also perfected the art of co-op of co-op multiplayer platforming. It's drop-in, drop-out, it's very fun, it's very frenetic, but it can also be serious. It all depends on who you're playing with. But for me, when it comes to Mario platformers, and platformers in general, I'm definitely a single player. And if you're playing by yourself, this game undoubtedly delivers. I think every new mechanic is executed flawlessly in this thing. Pretty much almost every (laughs) uh, new mechanic. I love the cat suit, which was, for me... uh, Especially a big fan of the cat suit, which was for me at first sort of a a point of consternation. I wasn't sure. It seemed very, um, I don't want, I don't know, I don't know what to say. Japanese. <laughs> it seemed very cutesy, but it 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 uh, definitely made for some interesting level designs and platforming opportunities as you played the game. And I and I ended up loving it. It was definitely my favorite power up from the game. Um, what else can I say about this Mario game? It's a great Mario game. The story's rubbish. Great visuals, excellent music. Uh, the one caveat being, again, m- with Mario, they're still married to that that old lives system, which I just don't think is worth anything. It doesn't add anything. It, and I guess I, I wasn't, I wasn't actively angry about it. This game, as I have been in the past, but it, 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 it does nothing for the experience for me. You could just get rid of it entirely, and I think you would have just as good of a game. Also, the the Super Duper Leaf, which is this game's version of the Super Guide, it's it's less annoying than the freaking the doorbell exclamation point blo- block from the new Super Mario Brothers series that just actively insults your inability to complete a level. I wish you could turn it off. That's all I want, Nintendo, is an off switch on the Super Guide. I don't need you to condescend <laughs> to me when I'm having a bad day and I, and I died five times in a level, because this level gets pretty hard later on, which is great. Good hard platformers are the best platformers, as far as I'm concerned. And I think when push comes to shove, this is the definitive. I mean, if you're going to get a Wii U, this is the game you should get. And I think this is the best Mario game since, if not if not the first Super Mario Galaxy, then definitely since Super Mario Galaxy 2. I think this even gives Super Mario Galaxy 2 a run for its money. Excellent game. A lot of game in this on this disc too. It's a it's an extensive experience. So check it out. Play it alone. Play it with friends. You're going to have a great time either way. Super Mario 3D World. Excellent, excellent game. All right, and finally, at number seven, The Stanley Parable. All right, now, <clears throat> how am I going to approach this game? Well, I can start by saying that for what Antichamber did with gaming mechanics, The Stanley Parable does with gaming dynamics. Okay, let's just well, I'm gonna float that out there. See if you understand what I'm saying. In it, you play Stanley, uh, who works in an office, and his job is to press buttons all day. He has a computer that gives him prompts to press buttons, and he just presses the buttons. So it's basically super, super boring, kind of the, the go postal kind of work. You know what I mean? And then one day, everyone but Stanley in, in the office completely disappears. 
And so then you, as Stanley, have the opportunity to leave the office. Leave, leave Stanley's office. Or not. And then go to the conference room to see where everybody is. Or not. And then go to the boss's office. Or not. And you basically simultaneously have and don't have an adventure. Are you confused yet? This, uh, let me just say that this, this game looks at game narrative in a way that no other game, I, 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 it, it's, it's completely unique. And, and it's hard to describe without spoiling it. But let me just say the story is, is so convoluted, so meta, that it's an absolute mess. But it's a slightly mess. The game is so perpendicular to the way games normally work, and it's so aware of this fact that it simply must be played. It's, I would say it would take you probably three hours to see what most, see most of the stuff the game has to offer. But it is densely packed, densely packed with narrative hiccups, unexpected twists on an already thoroughly twisted formula, constant surprises, and some of the gosh darn funniest segments I've played in any game. <laughs> just because of the way it manages to surprise you, to subvert your expectations. This is a very unconventional game. And I think this is one of those games that's going to open up the conversation, is it really a game? Because basically you're just walking. I'm trying to think that the only buttons you have available are like walk and like interact with anything. And that's pretty much it. It's, you're just exploring this world, kind of like Dear Esther a few years back. But I, I want to say to those people, maybe, maybe Dear Esther people would have a... I, I think the people who say that Dear Esther isn't really a game kind of have a bit of a case, you just walk. And then it tells a story. But this game could only work as a game. You're just walking. But the way it it subverts your expectations could only work. It couldn't work if you just sat as a static viewer, I don't think. I, it, so it's it can only work as a game. The voiceover is completely amazing. I, I don't know the dude's name, but he's British, and he's hilarious, and he's excellent. I think it's the closest anyone has come to bottling that magic that Valve managed to bottle with, with GLaDOS back in 2007 with Portal. In that, that mixture of of deprecation, of, of player deprecation, and sarcasm, and irony, and ju just the right little hint of darkness, but all packaged in hilarity. It's, it's, tough, it's tough to do that. I've, I've seen games try and fail, like uh, Quantum Conundrum, I think that was last year, uh, I mean 2012, Quantum Conundrum tried to do something like that, um, but they, they, they didn't quite get get close to that GLaDOS magic. This is the closest I've seen anybody get to, to being like GLaDOS. The graphics are dull when necessary, and grandiose when necessary, but no, no one's really playing this game for the graphics. Uh, when it comes down to why you should play this game, it's just simply this. No other game this year showed such a deep understanding of the way a player's mind works. And certainly no other game this year took more satisfaction in screwing with the player. If that doesn't sound like something you'd like, if this sounds pretentious, let me just say that it's all about that humor. It's leavened with that humor, and it, it, it could be a very pretentious, heavy experience if it hadn't been for that humor. I don't even think you know what this game is, <laughs> because I, haven't, I probably haven't probably explained it well enough. It's just a game about game narratives and about changing what game narratives are and turning it on its head, and turning you on your head, and turning it sideways and frontways, and every single ways, just, and, and leaving you sort of amazed that, some, that someone can manage a narrative of, of such complexity. I can't really talk about anything from it, because it's all spoilers, but here are three tips. Three tips. One, do everything in your power, if this sounds interesting to you, do everything, in your do everything within your power to play it yourself. Get it on Steam. Go to a friend's house who has it, and play it if your computer isn't good enough. Just just play it yourself. Only watch it as like an LP, or preferably a walkthrough with no commentary, as a last resort, as an absolute last resort, because I think there's there's a special connection of the game talking to the player that you lose by just watching it. Tip two. If you see a broom closet, step into it. As a matter of fact, if, the, if, there, if you see any opportunity to think outside of the box, do so. Because the game will 
will definitely reward you for that. And tip number three, play the demo, because it's a parody of demos, and it's hilarious. So that was number seven, The Stanley Parable. Satisfied with his game analysis, but rather thirsty, Griff took a drink. Upon hearing the narrator, Griff changed his mind in a moment of brief defiance. What's going on? Griff acted confused, despite the fact that he had planned ending the video in this manner all along, and I am in fact Griff doing a relatively bad British accent. That's a good point, I guess. Yep, I know it was. Well, I'll see you guys next time for another three games, number six through four. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Friday. Bye.